Good morning and thanks again for joining us here at Pinecrest Church Online as we worship together. I am Rhett Carson, the pastor of Behind Crest. On behalf of the church, we welcome you to our service this morning. First, I want to start off this morning by pointing attention to the uh, beautiful red rose we have in front of me this morning. That's placed uh, by Jim and Brenda Hart in honor of the birth of their newest great-grandchild, Vander Lewis Bright. So congratulations, Jim and Brenda. Congratulations to the parents as well. Uh, also, before we begin, I want to remind you we do have a prayer meeting each Wednesday online at 11 a.m. would love for you to join us. Contact the church office for more information. Uh, also, would encourage you if you're at home and using a computer to please uh, like and share our worship service, especially on Facebook if that's what you're using, uh, so that others can be encouraged to join us in worshiping God too each week. And then finally, I would encourage you to please consider uh, supporting Pinecrest as you're able uh, if you can and are willing and feel led to, uh, please uh, mail in tithes and offerings to the church office or use our online giving on our church website. As we come before the Lord together today, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that it has been made by you, that you are our work in it, and that, Lord, in that we can be glad and we can gather here to worship and praise you for the great God that you are, for all that you have done, for all that you are doing, for all that you will do for us, your people. Help us, Lord, in this hour to worship you in spirit and truth, to be reminded of all of the gifts you give us, to be reminded of the hope that we have, not just in this life, in the, but in the life to come, and to be reminded of your great Savior, our great Savior, your Son, that you have given us, and our helper and comforter, the Holy Spirit. We pray all this in the name of that great Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This time I want to invite Christian and Callie to come and lead us in singing this morning. I hope you will stand and use the subtitles on your screen to sing along with us. Our first hymn this morning is All Creatures of Our God and King. Creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Alleluia, Alleluia. The burning sun with golden beam, the silver moon with softer gleam. So strong, we clouds that sail in heaven alone. Oh, praise Him, Alleluia. The rising morning praise rejoice. The lights of evening find a voice. Oh, praise Him, oh. Ye men of 
of tender heart Forgiving others, take your part Oh, sing ye, alleluia He who long pain and sorrow bear Praise God and on Him cast your care Christian and thank you Callie. As we continue our time together this morning, want to spend some time before the Lord in prayer. I don't have time to go over every prayer request. We do have several members with operations and procedures this week, so please keep them in your prayers. If you'd like more information, please sign up to receive our church's prayer email. I would highlight that please be in prayer for Jeff Allers, one of our missionaries, broke his foot this week, and we're thankful he was able to have surgery. Uh, Please pray for a quick recovery. Uh, He and his family are planning to head back to Germany in July, and so he'll need to recover quickly to do so. Also, I'd ask you to please say a special prayer for Sally Burns. We've been praying for her. She needs heart surgery, uh, but that could put her kidney at risk. So she is in Cleveland Clinic right now, and so we want to pray for her that she would be able to have this procedure to heal her heart and it would be a safe procedure, and that God would use it to heal her and restore her for years to come. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you on this day, and we thank you for your love. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that no matter what place we find ourselves, and no matter what thing we might be dealing with in our life, that you are there. You are in control, and you have the power to work all things together for good. You have the power to strengthen us. You have the power to deliver us. You have the power to give us peace until you choose to do so. So help us, Lord, to trust in you. Help us, Lord, to turn to you. Help us, Lord, to praise you for who you are and all that you are doing for us. Father, we do lift up our concerns to you on this day as well. We do pray, Father, for this world We pray for the many people who are under the effects of the coronavirus. We thank you, Lord, for good news and good hope that comes out every day. But, Father, as we continue to see this disease spreading, we pray, Lord, for its end. We pray, Lord, for a cure and a vaccine. We pray, Lord, that it would just be miraculously removed, Father, from our presence and we would have to deal with it no longer. Father, please watch over those who are suffering at this time. Heal them from this disease. Please protect those who are taking care of them, whether they be medical workers uh, or their family. Please watch over uh, those that are working in our land and the small businesses. And we pray, Lord, uh, that you will keep them safe. And Father, see them through these times and restore our nation's economy. We pray for wisdom to the leaders of this land. We pray for wisdom to the leaders of our churches, Father, as we seek to reopen. Help us, Lord, to do so, and help us, Lord, to be able to do so safely. Father, we also pray for many that are dealing with other things at this time. We pray, Lord, for their grace and for your grace and your protection to be upon them. We pray especially for Sally Burns, that she would be able to receive the heart surgery she needs, and Lord, you would see her through this and restore her in her heart. 
We thank you for the recovery already and the successful surgery of Jeff Allers and pray that you would continue to help him recover. We pray, Lord, also for many who are dealing with other uh, physical ailments. And Father, we pray for Shirley Lamb. We pray, Lord, for uh, also on this day for Gwen Hicks. And Father, we pray for Carol Pertika and the many others on our prayer list as well. Lord, be with us. Guide us. Help us to turn to you. Be with those requests, Lord, that we don't know how to put into words and lift up to you today. But Lord, you know what they are and what we need. Be, Lord, with those requests that I am not aware of today, but you know way upon the hearts and minds of those who are listening. Help them, Lord, to know that you are with them. Help them, Lord, to know that you hear them. Help them, Lord, to know that you will work all things together for good. Help us, Father, to see you at work and to give you the thanks and to give you the praise. We pray this in the name of all names, the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Nothing can separate Even if I ran away Cause your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have new mercies for me every day Cause your love never fails You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night but joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails wind is strong and the water's deep But I'm not alone here in these open seas Cause your love never fails The chasm is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side but your love never fails You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning When the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails Because I know that you love me Your love never fails
Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Callie, once again. As we continue to worship God together this morning, I encourage you to turn with me in your Bibles to our scripture reading. We're once again in the book of Daniel, and we'll be looking at Daniel chapter 7 this morning. Daniel chapter 7. As we prepare to look at God's Word, I want to let you know that as we look at Daniel chapter 7, we're entering what we call a new section of Daniel. Daniel can actually be divided, the book of Daniel, into two sections. Chapters 1 through 6 we call the historical narrative, and it focuses on how God sustains Daniel and his three friends during their time of captivity and exile in Babylon. But then a transition takes place, and we have another section in Daniel chapter 7 through 12, which focuses on the prophecy section and things that God will do in the future. And most of these prophecies we actually would categorize as apocalyptic literature. Uh, This would be what we'd also describe as Jesus' Olivet Discourse and also famously the book of Revelation. We're going to see some interesting images in here that reveal God's truth to us. I want to read a description and definition of apocalyptic literature as given to us by Dr. Ian Duguid. He writes, Biblical apocalyptic literature is a revelation of the ending of this present age, which is an age characterized by conflict and its replacement by the final age of peace. It shows us ahead of time the end of the kingdoms of this world and their replacement by the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. This revelation is unfolded in complex and mysterious imagery and has the purpose of comforting and exhorting the faithful. So that's a definition of what apocalyptic literature is. Before we read this passage and look at some of these images that Daniel and God reveal to us, I want to give us four useful rules for reading apocalyptic literature. The first two are really rules that I would put before you for any time you read scripture, but I also want to add two more that I want to especially remind you and have you to keep in mind as we look at apocalyptic literature this week and in the weeks to come. The first two rules that apply to all of scripture is first I want to remind you that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for correcting, teaching, training, and correcting in righteousness as we read in 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. So even those passages that we might stay away from if it was up to us or we might find challenging or difficult. Many of us know Daniel 1 through 6 and all of its stories, but maybe we are tempted to skip ahead and go to the next book of the Bible when we get to Daniel chapter 7. But we need to remember that God gave us this word, gave us his word for a reason. Even these difficult, complicated passages are useful and beneficial and given to us by God for a reason. The second thing I would remind you about that applies to all of Scripture is not only is it God-breathed and God-inspired, another rule as we study Scripture is that we allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. The law of perspicuity, we allow the unclear passages to be interpreted and divined by the clear passages. So whenever you come to God's Word and you have difficulty understanding it, I want you to remember something. God is not going to contradict Himself. So just because you're struggling with one passage, you can go to other passages of Scripture and oftentimes they will help you understand even those difficult passages. So we need to remember to do that when we get to these complicated passages of Scripture as well. Two rules I would also give you that apply more directly to apocalyptic literature, as we, I want you to keep in mind as we study this together, is often in apocalyptic literature, it is a both and and not an either or. For instance, if somebody said, do you want chocolate or vanilla ice cream? A very good answer is yes, I'll take both. It doesn't always have to be choosing between the two. And if somebody says, do you want ice cream now or later? Another great answer is yes, I want both. I want ice cream now and I want ice cream later. It doesn't have to be always an either or. The reason I tell you that is when we come and look at apocalyptic literature, we're going to read about several visions. And I want you to keep in mind that each vision doesn't necessarily 
have to be talking about something different. It can actually have a different uh, event being described by different visions in different ways. Both visions can be talking about one and the same thing. I believe we have that here in Daniel chapter 7 with the description of the four beasts. I believe it's actually a recapitulation of Nehemiah's dream in Daniel chapter 2. It's telling us about the same thing but using different imagery. We also believe find that in Revelation when you're talking about the seven trumpets and the seven seals, the seven bowls. I believe, are telling us about the same events, just using different imagery. It's a both and, not an either or. I would also apply that same rule when talking about, well, are these events and descriptions describing something that's about to happen, or is it describing something that happens way in the future? With apocalyptic literature, it can be a both and, not an either or. It can both be describing events that are about to happen, and will continue to happen, and events that will happen at the end of time. I believe Daniel chapter 7, in our description here, is actually a description of things that are about to happen in the earth and during Christ's first arrival, but is also a description in many ways, an accurate description of what will happen when Jesus Christ returns as well. And I believe that's the same thing with the Olivet Discourse, that Jesus gives us in Matthew. It also contains descriptions of what's about to happen to the disciples, but also tells us about what will happen to the followers of God in the last of the last days as well. Another rule I want you to keep in mind before we read our passage and as we study apocalyptic literature is this. Don't lose sight of the forest for sake of the trees. What I mean by that is you might find a lot about a tree if you put your nose up right against it and look at it, but you might lose an idea of everything else that is happening around it. We as humans, especially when we get to these apocalyptic literature, we can get so focused on one tiny detail that we want to understand and figure out, and we begin to debate with each other about it, that we lose sight of the theme and what we're supposed to really take away from the passage. God may not have revealed exactly what each tiny detail means, and we need to be okay with that. We need to make sure that we, first of all, comprehend the big message and the big picture that God wants us to see in this passage. And for instance, as we turn to Daniel chapter 7 through 12, If we look at the big picture and the big theme, we might be confused by the details, but we should be able to see clearly the same theme in these chapters as we saw through chapters 1 through 6. The two themes that it is important to remain faithful to God in difficult circumstances, but then the even bigger theme that God is faithful to us in difficult circumstances. So with those few things said, let's turn now to Daniel chapter 7. This is a vision given to Daniel not after chapter 6, but actually during the reign of Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson who was ruling over Babylon. And I don't have time to cover this entire chapter today, so we're going to look at Daniel chapter 7 and 8 over the next three weeks together. Today I'm going to focus on the four beasts of Daniel chapter 7 and their defeat by the Ancient of Days. Next week, we're going to focus in on the Son of Man description given in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And then in two weeks, we're going to focus in on the small horn of the fourth beast as we also study the small horn of the goat in Daniel chapter 8. So if I don't cover something today, hopefully I'll be able to get to it in the weeks to come. Let's go to God's Word, and as I read Daniel Chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. 
And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear, it was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw the night visions. And behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up another among them, um, among them another horn, a little one before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, With the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever." Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet, and about the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn that came up, and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth, and trample it down, and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that this word is breathed by you, is inspired by you, and it is given to us for a great reason. It is given to reveal your love and your truth and your instructions to us. Help us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit to hear and understand what these truths and instructions are, and help us, Lord, to live according to them for your praise and for your glory and for the greatness and glory of your kingdom, we pray. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Have you ever had a terrible, awful dream where you are maybe running from something or facing some great monster and you're so frightened and panic, but then all of a sudden you realize you're dreaming and you wake up or you wake up and realize that none of that was actually happening. It was all just a dream. Do you remember the relief you felt in that moment as you realize, ah, this is something I don't have to deal with. This is something... I don't have to worry about. This is something I don't have to face. Daniel had a terrible dream, didn't he, that night? As he dreamed of four beasts, which could accurately be described as four great monsters in Daniel chapter 7 and in the vision that God had given him. These were grotesque monsters, both in their physical appearance, in their power, but also in the actions and the atrocities which they committed. This would be something that none of us would want to face in real life. These would be beasts that none of us would want to even dream about, but yet this is the vision God gave to Daniel and then passed on to us. Let's take a brief moment and let's try and peel out what is this vision all about. Who are these four beasts? And then us, let us look briefly at some lessons and some things we need to take away from this passage. So who are these four beasts that God revealed to Daniel in his dream? Well, we're told in Scripture that these beasts each represented a king or a kingdom. But we're not told specifically which kings and kingdoms they represent here. So all we can do is take educated guesses at this point. But I think we were able to make some very good guesses, especially when we parallel it along with the vision of Nebuchadnezzar's statue in Daniel chapter 2. So once again, as we look at this passage, a lot of people come to this and they like to interpret that the four kings and four kingdoms are the ones that are going to take place after during Daniel's life and directly afterwards. So they like to interpret it as saying that the first kingdom, the first beast, is going to represent Babylon. Then the next kingdom will be the Medes. The next kingdom will be the Persians. And then the fourth kingdom will be the Greeks. Those that make this argument really like it because they want Antiochus Epiphanes to be the small horn. However, I really like interpreting this passage much like I did Daniel chapter 2 and saying that the first kingdom is the Babylonians, the second kingdom is the Medians and the Persians combined, the third kingdom is the Greeks, and the fourth kingdom is the Romans. The reason I prefer this is because I believe that these beasts more aptly describe each of those empires in what God reveals to Daniel in these visions, but also especially because who is the when does the stone come in Nebuchadnezzar's statue dream? When does the Son of Man arrive on the scene which we interpret as Jesus Christ? It's not during the Greeks, but it's during the fourth kingdom, the Romans. So let's take a moment and let's look at these descriptions and let's talk about reasons why I think they aptly describe these empires. Now, one thing I want you to know right out front is I'm not that smart, okay? I didn't come up with all these ideas myself. I was smart enough to buy a book and read the writings and discoveries of people much smarter than me, and so I'm passing on those descriptions to you today that I found useful in helping me arrive to where I am today. So let's look at these beasts one by one briefly. First of all, we're told the first kingdom is described as a lion with eagle wings. I think that's a very apt description of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, this first kingdom is also the first kingdom of Daniel chapter 2, where we're told specifically by God that the gold head was Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. I think this is also an apt description because... We are told in Jeremiah 49, there he, the prophet, describes Nebuchadnezzar as, guess what? A lion, and then later on as an eagle. I also like going with Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar here because what do we say are told happens to this first beast? 
We're told it is given the mind of a man. And isn't that what we read about and studied in Daniel chapter 4 at the humbling and then the restoration of Nebuchadnezzar who for a time thought he was a beast but then was given the mind of a man. Let's now look at the second beast. The second beast, we're told, is described as a bear raised up on one side. I believe this is an apt description of Media Persia. Why do I say that? Well, it could mean that the bear standing up on its side, or large on one side, means that it's standing up ready to pounce. But another way of seeing that is to say that one side of the bear, like its right side, was stronger than the left and larger than the left. This is actually the the same description we have in the next chapter, chapter 8, when we're describing the ram. He has one horn that is larger and stronger than the other. This is a fitting way to describe the Medes and the Persians because the Mede side of the empire was much weaker and smaller than the larger and stronger Persian side. It is also an apt description of Cyrus and the Persians because we're told that what was in the bear's mouth, three bones. Well, did you know this? King Cyrus had to defeat three kings in order to come to power over the Median Persian Empire. And also, after he came to power, guess what Cyrus did? He defeated three kingdoms. The Babylonians, the Lydians, and the Egyptians. So once again, this is an apt description of the Medes and the Persians. Let's take a moment and let's look at the third beast. That beast is described as a leopard with four wings and four heads. To me, this makes sense in describing Alexander the Great and the Greeks. What would a leopard with four wings be able to do? It would be able to move and hunt very quickly. What do we know about Alexander the Great? He was able to conquer the known world very quickly. In fact, he was able to do so by the age of 32. And then what happened to his empire? It was divided into, guess what? Four separate kingdoms. Once again, an apt description of the third beast when we apply it to Greece. Then the fourth beast, what description are we given there? We're given a description of a beast that really can't be paired with any other animal. It is an atrocity. It is something that can't be described with teeth of iron and claws and ten horns. This makes sense as Rome. Once again, we see a parallel with Daniel chapter 2. We're told that the feet of the statue were iron. Here we're told that the teeth of the beast are iron. And this beast was different, we're told. It had than the rest. Another way to interpret that would be to say it had more power. It had more strength. It had more length. It had more influence than any other human empire are king and such is the case with Rome its power its influence is still being felt in the world today another interesting point that the scholar made uh, that I read as I was getting ready for the sermon today is we could talk about the Caesars of Rome in one sense you could say this beast had 10 horns it had five times as much the power of any normal beast. But an interesting point is made is if you go from Julius Caesar to Domitian in the Roman Empire, guess what? You have 12 Caesars, but two of those Caesars only ruled for a matter of months. If you remove them from the equation, guess what number you're left with? You're left with the number 10, an interesting point. But above all, this beast makes sense to me because who arrived while we're, this beast is described? the Son of Man, who we know and believe to be Jesus Christ. That happened during the Roman Empire. So we have four beasts. These descriptions might throw us off for a minute, but scholars have been able to point us to a great understanding of who these four beasts could have represented. But as I mentioned to you earlier, I don't want to get us too caught up in the details. Even if you or you read another 
commentary that takes a different take on this passage, I think there are four important truths and four important lessons that we can all take away from this. I've got four lessons because there were four beasts. I thought that would only be appropriate. So let's look at four lessons, four themes, four things that we can clearly take away no matter how and who we interpret these beasts to represent. The first thing I want you to learn as we look at Daniel chapter 7 is this. God is in control. Daniel chapter 7 teaches us very clearly that God is in control at all times and in all situations. Many times we may feel that God just created the world and then abandoned it, but the Bible reveals something very different. It reveals that the entire time God is on his throne, God is reigning, God is in control of each and everything, even the monsters that we face. God is in control. A very interesting thing happens in this passage. Remember that we're told that the sea opens up and the four monsters came out? But who opened the sea. We're told it was the winds of heaven. God saw about the creation of these monsters, and God will see about the end of these monsters. They will come and go. God continues to reign. God continues to rule. God is in control. Brothers and sisters, whatever difficulty, whatever monster you're facing today, Don't believe the lies of the devil. God hasn't abandoned you. God hasn't forgotten about you. God is still in control. These things will pass. God and his reign will continue. The second lesson I want to point us to briefly as we look at Daniel chapter 7 and the beast is this. Not only do we need to see that God is in control, but we also need to be reminded by Daniel chapter 7 that monsters are real. There are monsters, there are beasts in this world today. Daniel didn't have the blessing of getting to wake up from his dream and realize that the monsters never existed. He woke up from his dream, was actually frightened because he realized that the monsters was real and he was going to have to face and he was going to have to deal with them and God's people was going to have to deal with them. Monsters exist today Monsters which represent wicked men and women, wicked kings and queens, wicked rulers and wicked kingdoms that do terrible things out of greed and out of fear and out of pride and out of selfish ambitions. They devour other beasts in other kingdoms. They fight amongst themselves and they even do great harm to God's people as we read about the beasts in this passage. The monsters are real. They do exist and we will have to face and deal with them and so we need to be reminded of that it takes just but a moment to look at the news story and we can point to monsters that exist in the world today can't we we could point to countries such as the terrible things happening in North Korea or China or Iran but don't think that we're free from monsters here in America There are also powerful people that are doing terrible things both to come to power and once they come to power and are even doing terrible things and seeking out to persecute and make life difficult for Christians. Monsters exist. And if we gaze upon the monsters like Daniel, we will quickly become afraid. We need to realize that monsters are real, but we also need to realize another truth as we come to Daniel chapter 7. And that is that all monsters will be defeated. Yes, they exist. Yes, they are real. But they will be defeated. What happens after we're given this description of all these grotesque monsters? And as we hone in on this monster and this beast, unlike any other, the fourth beast, all of a sudden, Daniel's dream and his vision cuts away. And instead of focusing on the beast and on the monster, it focuses on God. It focuses on the Ancient of Days. And it gives us a description of God's throne room. What's happening in God's throne room? What's happening with the Ancient of of days in this passage. Well, we're in the earth. What did we see in the earth as we looked upon it, as we looked at the monsters? We saw chaos. 
But what's happening in God's kingdom, what's happening in God's throne room, there is order. Everything is exactly like it's supposed to be in doing everything it's supposed to do. What happens when we turn our gaze to the earth? What happens when we turn our gaze to the monsters? We see injustice. These beasts are getting away with things they should never be allowed to get away with. But what happens when we cut and we look at God, the Ancient of Days, and His kingdom? Justice is prevailing. God is opening the books and about to enact justice on everyone. What happens when we look at the monsters? What happens when we look at the beasts and we look at the earth? We have fear, don't we? But what happens when we look at God in the ancient of days? We have hope because we see that God is a warrior and his throne is described as a fiery chariot. And at any moment, God is going to go to war and bring down and defeat every beast and every monster. In fact, we see right here in Daniel chapter 7, the war between God and this fourth beast that no one else on earth could handle, and it is the most anticlimactic battle ever. A current superhero movie that's out and many people know of talks about a being that's so powerful that all he has to do is snap his fingers and everyone is brought to their knees. But here in the Bible, we're given a description of God. He doesn't even have to snap his fingers. He just has to will it. And what happens to the beast? The beast is instantly destroyed and thrown down and burned and can do nothing and can put up no fight against God, the ancient of days. Such is the overwhelming power of God over any monster and any beast in this world and that will ever be in this world. God is in control and God will defeat every monster. All he has to do is is will it? My mind is immediately cast to Jesus and his disciples on the lake in Matthew chapter 8. Do you remember the storm that comes? And then the rain is pouring, the wind is blowing, the waves are crashing into the boat, and all the disciples think they're about to sink, that their, their lives are gone. This is probably how Daniel felt as he looked at the four beasts and monsters coming out of the sea. But what did the disciples do? They wake up Jesus, and Jesus says, Be still. Instantly, the storm clouds are gone. The rain is gone. The wind is gone. And the sea is calm. This is exactly what happens even with the monsters, we're told in Daniel chapter 7. As soon as God wills it, immediately their power, their reign are all gone. They are defeated. Earthly kings and queens, wicked men, and women, earthly, human kingdoms will rise and fall. But God, the Son of Man, will reign forever and His kingdom will always endure. Daniel chapter 7 reminds us of this. And then one fourth and final lesson. Not only are we told that God will reign forever, but guess who will reign with God forever? His saints. God's saints, God's people will be given an everlasting kingdom. God not only comes, the Son of Man not only comes and defeats all of the monsters and all of the enemies, but then they allow to reign with them the saints, God's people, the ones they came to rescue. God's humble people may be singled out. They may be persecuted. They may have very little in this life, but one day they will be rescued and they will be placed in a great power, in a great kingdom, a kingdom free from any monsters. Those monsters who were able to fight and claw and establish a name for themselves and gather many things, they will be defeated. Everything they have will be taken away from them and their reign and their kingdom will end. But those lowly, humble people of God, They will be blessed beyond all comparison and they will be given authority beyond all comparison because they will be welcomed and placed on high in the kingdom that God, the Ancient of Days, and Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, has established. 
This hope is not found in ourselves and in what we're able to do, but by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and particularly what he does for us upon the cross. Because if we put our faith and hope and trust in Jesus Christ upon the cross, we are told in Scripture that his victory over sin becomes our victory over sin. His victory over death becomes our victory over death. His victory over the monsters becomes our victory over the monsters of this world. We will be saved and we will be placed on high. We will be welcomed into God's kingdom when Jesus Christ returns and there we will reign with him for all of eternity. Brothers and sisters, we are getting into some complicated passages in Daniel chapter 7, but I hope you realize and see the beautiful truth of God even in this passage. There are monsters in this world, but we don't have to fear them. Not because they're not real, and not because we're stronger than them, but because our God and our Savior are stronger. They have defeated them, they will defeat them, and their victory will be our victory if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I want to close by reading that famous lyric from Martin Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. There we read these words. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, For lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the truth of your word that is reality in this world today. Yes, they are monsters, but by your power and grace, the monsters we face are defeated. We are forgiven, we are your child, and we will live and reign in your kingdom forever when your Son, our Savior, returns. What a great and glorious day that will be. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, we pray. Come quickly. Amen. As we conclude our time together, let's stand and sing once again. This time, Callie and Christian are going to lead us in singing for all the saints. I encourage you to stand and sing with us at home. the
saints triumphant, rise in pride array, the King of glory passes on his way, alleluia, alleluia, from earth's wide Brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us today. Now receive the Lord's benediction. Now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.